The institution of the refugee camp really sprung up during and after World War II. And we're now seeing that the average length of stay in a refugee camp is over seven years. Camps were always meant to be temporary. You can see that from the kind of housing that's provided. Those structures are not very durable. A tent lasts six or eight months, and yet we're planning on people being there decades or even generations now. So the camp as a temporary structure for providing aid to people who will return home is really no longer functioning, especially in the case of Syrian refugees who have really no home to return to now. I spent 16 months in a camp for internally displaced people in the Republic of Georgia, just over the border from South Ossetia. And these are about uh, 35,000 people who were ethnically cleansed in a 2008 war between Georgia and Russia. And one of the reasons I wanted to immerse myself in this situation is that most of what we know about humanitarian aid to refugees, internally displaced people, and other forced migrants, it's written from the perspective of large institutions, like the United Nations High Council for Refugees. So I wanted to understand how refugees themselves use aid from the Georgian government, from large international donors, in order to create new lives while still under intense pressure from the Russian 58th Army, which was less than half a kilometer away from some of the places I studied. One thing we know about humanitarian aid is that it rolls in like a tsunami in an intense flow of aid right after a crisis, but then tapers off pretty quickly, leaving people without a sustainable source of income or of goods and services. So I was really interested in also understanding what the um, effects are of humanitarian abandonment. What happens when the aid is cut off and people are left on their own? And what I found, in fact, is that the outcomes are not very good. We find that people's health outcomes are very poor. They're dying of eminently treatable diseases like high blood pressure and diabetes. We find that their economic prospects are very low. In some of the camps I studied, more than 90% of the people are still out of work. So because these camps are geographically isolated, reintegration into a host society even if it's one where they speak the language and they're ostensibly part of this country, it's very, very challenging for people once they've been closed up into a camp. The Syrian civil war has displaced almost six million people, and um, many of them are still stuck inside Syria, but many of them have migrated to um, camps, a lot of them sponsored by the United Nations, um, in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. And right now there are so many refugees in Lebanon, for example, that there are whole cities that have more than half their population as refugees. So the pressure on surrounding countries and on refugee camps has been incredibly intense. So even the European countries who are willing to step are now talking about accepting 160,000 refugees. And that's out of you know, a world population now of almost 60 million refugees and internally displaced people. So the best, most ambitious plans in Europe are still falling dramatically short of the need um, that refugees will have worldwide. So I think in one sense, that we have to start talking about how to integrate large numbers of refugees very quickly. And that's going to be very challenging given the political situation for Europe and also for the United States, which currently is taking less than 1% of the people who apply for asylum here. This is not going to be a one month or a one year effort, but a process that is going to take decades and is really going to reshape the landscape of Europe and of the United States. So we need to think about long-term sustained aid as we try and integrate these people into Western society.